them. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for trickling in and being on time. We are going to start this webinar at 6.05 just to give everyone some time to join and get settled in. If you could please do us the favor of um, yeah, just getting comfortable, feel free to grab a pen, grab a pencil and paper, whatever you need. Um, but this webinar will also be recorded, so no pressure to like be taking super in-depth notes. You can always re-watch this after we've posted it, um, and we'll drop the link to our website where you can find the recording. Um, in just a bit. Um, but we have also um, a really great announcement. Alice is joining us today in lieu of Joseph. Um, so she is one of uh, Joseph's coworkers from UC Berkeley Law, and she'll introduce herself in just a minute. Um, but they work really closely together. So we're excited to have her on board. And of course, Maida Espinosa, a Central Valley board member and also a student at Harvard Law from the Central Valley. Um, so thank you so much for coming to our webinar. Again, we'll start at 6.05. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. For those of y'all who are already in here and are maybe curious, uh, your audio and visuals are off um, for attendees just because this is being recorded and we want to keep your identities anonymous um, just for legal reasons and for your own protection. But there will be a portion at the end for Q&A where we will give you permission to raise your hand to ask questions um, or you can just type them at any point during the webinar in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, so feel free to drop your questions as they come up or save them until the end um, and we'll get around to them for sure. Um, but just for the flow of the webinar, we'll probably hold off until the last 10 to 15 minutes to answer them. But yeah, thanks again for joining and just uh, give us a couple more minutes for folks to join. Awesome. So it is 6.05, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'll kind of go over everything I said one last time in case someone maybe joined a little bit late or didn't quite get to hear everything. Uh, so quick introduction. My name is Skatya. I'm events coordinator for Central Valley Scholars. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And this is the 2022 Central Valley Scholars Law School webinar being co-hosted now by Alice Young from UC Berkeley Law and Maida Espinosa Martinez, she, her, ella pronouns as well. Uh, who is a Central Valley Scholars board member and also speaking on behalf of um, Harvard Law Program as a student from the Central Valley, uh, just starting off her program there. So they'll do their own round of introductions in just a second, but before they do, um, I wanna start us off with a land acknowledgement. Um, so for our participants, your audio and camera is already off, um, but wherever you find yourself today, feel free to plant your feet on the floor, close your eyes, turn cameras off um, for our hosts if you would like to, whatever you need to do to get more comfortable in this space as I read off um, our acknowledgement today. Um, so I wanna take a moment to acknowledge where we are, that the earth below our homes and below our feet is Yokut's territory and has belonged to and been tended to by Yokut's people for hundreds of thousands of years. When white settlers arrived to what we otherwise know as the United States, they enacted genocide and theft of the land, labor and resources, attempting to wipe out indigenous communities entirely. 
It's important to acknowledge the land that we're living on and to recognize our history and relationship to the ongoing legacy of colonization in the U.S. And to also recognize that the Yokut's people are still here and through resistance and resilience are still in the front lines struggling for land rights, collective liberation, and an end to white supremacy. I invite you to take a moment to think about your relationship to this land and its history and let those who have come before us in the struggle inform us on where we're going so that together we can reimagine and collectively build a world in which we're all free. So with that being said, um, shortly after this, I will also drop a link in the chat for folks who are maybe not joining us from the Central Valley today. Um, I myself am in the Bay Area, but I'm a Central Valley native. And um, I know we all kind of find ourselves in different places in this Zoom era. So I'll drop that link in case you're curious as to whether you are also on Yucut territory or elsewhere. Um, but yeah, that's our land acknowledgement. Um, and just for folks who may not have ever engaged with Central Valley scholars before, I'll do a brief little um, introduction. Ooh, okay, someone asked if there are captions. Thank you so much for asking. Also feel free to comment and let us know, you know, if at any point you can't hear us or things like that in using the Q&A box as well. Um, I will look into whether or not we have captions. It's possible that we do not, but I'll try to turn them on if possible. If not, feel free to email us for a transcript or anything that might be helpful um, to meet that accommodation if needed. But, but yeah, brief overview of Central Valley Scholars before I hand it off to our wonderful hosts. Uh, we are an official 501c3, uh, which means we are basically officially, you know, a nonprofit um, doing educational equity work here in the Central Valley. We were started uh, and are still being led by a lot of Central Valley students and recent alumni from Berkeley, other UCs, CSUs, etc. Um, so essentially we're in um, education equity nonprofit and we do a lot of different programming and are hoping to continue to expand what we have to offer. We have our public workshops, which is what we're in right now, these webinars um, that cover a wide range of topics, everything from how to apply to college to understanding financial aid and also, you know, our post undergraduate workshops as well. Um, so those are happening year round and are always free to anyone and everyone. We do also have um, our $25,000 worth of scholarships. It actually has like doubled over the years. Um, so we're really proud of that fact. Um, and you can always check them out on our website. The cycle for this year has closed, but you're always welcome to reapply next year if you qualify. Uh, we also offer our thumbtership program and our uh, Black Youth Empowerment Program, which see about 10 members per year. It sort of varies, um, but that's a very much like a hand-holding process through um, college applications. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about what we have to offer. And in terms of our webinars, we do have two more coming up this summer, August 8th and August 10th. One is going to be a graduate school um, webinar hosted by actually a returning host, um, named Brian Ramirez, he's fantastic, gonna talk to you guys about the grad school application and give his own tips and tricks. So that's happening August 8th. August 10th is a medical school webinar by a new host, um, Hector Gonzalez, fantastic medical student, really great story from McFarland, Wormington community. Um, they're both really great. Uh, so I encourage you all to RSVP to those as well. And I'll drop the link in the chat in just a moment. Um, but that's a little bit about what we do. Um, definitely feel free to ask questions about our organization as well if you're interested. I don't want to take up any more of our host time. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Alice to introduce herself um, and get right into it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of the webinar today. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you all. Thanks so much for joining in your evening to learn more about the law school admissions process. Uh, my name is Alice, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Admissions for Outreach and Recruitment at Berkeley Law. Um, I grew up in the San Diego area. I went to UC Davis for college. It was the first of my family to go to college and to graduate with a bachelor's degree. Um, and I've been at Berkeley Law for almost 10 years now, so it's been quite a while. I really do think it, the law school is a wonderful place to work, really love my job, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, in my role, I do everything from presenting the law school at various events, um, educating um, folks about the law school admissions process, and also awarding gift aid and scholarships. So uh, very happy to be here with you all.
Um, I think I can jump in and do a quick little intro, Alice, before you take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Myra Espinosa Martinez. I'm really excited to be participating in this webinar today. Um, I am a Central Valley native, so I was born and raised in Visalia, California. I'm a first gen college student and will be the first person in my immediate and extended family to attend law school. So I'm actually about to start law school um, in the next couple of weeks. I went to Harvard University for undergrad, graduated in 2016, um, originally planned to just take a year or two off before going to law school, but life happens. And so I um, have different workforce experience, which I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about and sort of my journey to uh, law school. Um, most recently, I was working as a summer associate at a big law firm. Um, that's sort of like a term of the trade, a big law firm. I'll explain that as well. Um, in LA called Kirkland and Ellis. Um, I am also a board member of Central Valley Scholars, so this organization means a lot to me, and I am really excited uh, to be a part of this webinar today. Okay, um, great. So I think um, I'm going to now kind of walk you through the major components of the law school Some of you might be thinking about applying this fall. Um, some of you might still be a few years out from applying or still in college or plan to take some gap years and work after you graduate from law school. So this is going to be a really kind of broad overview of the entire um, process, um, but I'm happy to answer questions later on if you do have specific questions uh, about kind of applying you know, in the next year. Um, so this kind of walks you through um, each of the application components that I'm going to be talking through in today's presentation. Everything from sort of just thinking in general about where you want to apply, getting set up with an LSAC account, getting your application materials together, and each of the written components. Uh, next slide, please, Katia. Okay, so let's just start kind of thinking um, the first uh, step in the law school process is, um, well, number one, thinking, is this, is law school for me? Is this the right path for me? Um, so firstly, just thinking about what you, you know, what are your career ambitions? What do you see yourself doing with a law degree? Um, you will get the JD, the Juris Doctorate, when you graduate from law school. And most people do intend to you know, be practicing attorneys uh, when they graduate from law school, but we also have students that go into various other positions in government, in policy, politics, um, in nonprofits and education and the business world as well. So you don't necessarily want to practice law, um, but you should have a good idea of, you know, why law school? Does that make sense in your path? There are other graduate programs out there. So I think initially just thinking about, you know, what are, what are your career goals? Um, and then, you know, if you confirmed that law school, you know, is the right path for you, um, then you can kind of start to think about where you would want to apply. And this is the first sort of step in the process that you can start about a year ahead of time. Uh, most law school admissions um, applications open um, in the fall, usually around September 1st. So if you're thinking about this as far as timeline goes, about a year ahead of time, so um, uh, in the fall prior, is when you can start researching law schools. And that's a good time to start connecting with law schools, like in webinars like this or going to LSAC forums to learn more about law schools so that you can start forming your list. 
Um, and it might look similar to how you went about, about applying to undergrad, um, where you sort of came up with, you know, these are my dream schools, uh, these are my target schools, these are my safety schools. Um, maybe you didn't go about doing that in college, maybe you went to community college and transferred, so it might look different for different folks. Um, for most of you, you're not gonna, going to have taken the LSAT already, so you maybe don't know what your LSAT score is. That's going to be the unknown. Um, and you have a, a good idea of what your college GPA is, so you can at least start researching as far as um, what program medians are looking for. But of course, keep in mind, every law school is going to be looking holistically at your application. So I always say, do not you know, decide whether you're not you're applying to a school just based on those medians or if the fact that you meet those or below them or above them. We really are looking at all of your application components, which is why it's so important um, to work on both the written pieces as well as um, the numeric pieces like your GPA and your LSAT score. So I'll go into those later, um, but that is one way that you can at least sort of start your list. Um, you're going to want to start researching applications and scholarship deadlines. That'll be on each school's website. They'll give you an overview of when those deadlines are so that you can, um, what I would recommend doing is keeping a spreadsheet with all of those deadlines. Um, schools might have separate deadlines too for certain scholarships or if you're thinking about applying early decision. So it's best to try to keep those organized so that you'll have a good idea of what, what kind of um, timeline and deadlines you have to keep in mind. And it's a good time to start thinking about the fees for each law school and figuring out, um, do they offer a fee waiver? I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, um, uh, but figuring out how you're going to pay for all of those components because many, you know, most people know law school itself is quite expensive, but the application process is also very expensive. You're paying LSAC fees for the LSAT, for your um, credential assembly service report, you're paying law school's fees to apply, potentially even for receipt deposits later on in the process. So it's better to know that ahead of time and try to plan out um, how you're going to pay for those things so that you're already kind of prepared for that going into the process. And lastly, a note about school selection is that that's going to vary for each of you depending on what matters most to you. Um, some people really are um, very interested in the location. Um, if you really want to be in California or you really want to be in another area or you really want to be in a city as opposed to a more rural or suburban environment, think about those things. Um, so location can be important. School culture, as much as you can learn about the school from not only talking with admissions representatives, but a lot of times schools have student ambassadors who work um, for their office who can tell you about their experience at a particular law school. Sometimes they have alumni panels. So um, you don't necessarily need to go and start visiting schools, but as much as you can try to find about that school's particular culture, um, of course, curricular interests, some schools are known for certain things. So if you do have a good idea of what kinds of law school classes you would like to take or clinics or just particularly communities that you want to work with and see what each school offers in that area, that can be really helpful. Um, and then of course, there's those major factors like career prospects, um, looking at each school's um, ABA 509 report. That is required for each law school to post that on their admissions website or somewhere on their law school website. It covers admission statistics like the median, GPA, and LSAT, how many applications they received, how many students are in the intern class, what the average amount of gift aid is, and how um, what the percentage of students that receive gift aid. And it also includes career statistics as well. For example, how many students end up graduating from that school, how many transfer out, how many students end up passing, passing the bar, and how many are employed nine months after graduating law school. So it is a big investment. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to look into as well. So those are just a few things to kind of start thinking about find out what your priorities are, and then you can start building out your list and talking with schools so you have a good idea about where you wanna apply in the next fall.
Okay, so you started kind of thinking about where you're looking at applying. Um, the next step would be to register for an LSAC account. LSAC is the Law School Admissions Council. They oversee the entire law school admissions process. So you'll definitely want uh, to create an LSAC account if you have not already done so. specific email account um, that you can check regularly rather than like your, you know, your private, your personal Gmail account, just because you are going to be receiving a lot of emails, um, not just from law schools, uh, but also from LSAC. Uh, they have what's called the Credential uh, Candidate Referral Service, which is listed on the slide here, CRS, which you can opt into, which basically allows law schools to find you. So we uh, can run a report and tell, say, generate a report on everybody in this area. Uh, we can run it by LSAT or GPA or just by school location, and we can send out emails um, about applying. A lot of law schools also send out their fee waivers this way as well. So I would recommend applying for CR, uh, CRS with the caveat that you are going to be receiving a lot of emails from schools. So that's why it might be nice to have a separate account that you can check, uh, but just make sure you're checking that regularly then because that'll be all of your law school um, communications will be in there. Um, LSAC also administers the LSAT, which for most of you are probably going to be taking the LSAT. Um, law schools have started accepting the GRE, um, but most, I wouldn't say all of them do that, a lot of them do. Um, but if you're really set on going to law school, I would encourage you to start with the LSAT and see where that goes and um, having the GRE as another option in the process. LSAC is also going to send each school your CAS report, your Credential Assembly Service Report, which I'm gonna talk about in another slide. Um, and that's basically your, um, the numeric pieces of the application, your transcripts with your GPA and your LSAT scores. So it's really great to have the LSAC account set up. You can also, they also put on events um, every year as well. They have a lot of resources on their website I'd recommend checking out. They do workshops, they partner with law schools um, for prep events. Um, and uh, they also host uh, forums in the fall, which our forums are like large scale. Um, they're usually in like conference, you know, like hotel conference rooms or big ballrooms where every um, ABA accredited law school is invited to attend. And we each have a little table and you really like walk around and, and get to talk to representatives from each of those schools. So uh, for those of you who might be applying in the next year or two, uh, this fall, um, we are, they are going to be hosting forums, so that's a great way if your um, undergraduate school does not host a law fair, or even if they do and you just want to talk to more schools, it's a good way to reach out, talk with schools. Some schools pass out fee waivers in that as well, or you can get on their mailing lists. So um, I would definitely recommend looking at the count on LSAC's calendar to see what events they're putting on for the fall. Uh oh. <laughs> Let me reload the slides. Oh, I think maybe I accidentally clicked on the link and that made it take me to the website instead. My apologies. There we go. Okay, perfect. I'm seeing the slide again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the dreaded LSAT. Um, most of you have probably heard about it. Um, so as I said, this is a test that, that, that all law schools accept and that most uh, um, applicants take. Um, most law schools are going to require some kind of standardized test. So as I mentioned before, I definitely recommend starting with the LSAT. Um, but if you've taken the GRE and you've performed really well on the GRE, that could be an option depending on the schools you're looking to apply to. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll, I'll kind of stick to just talking about the LSAT. 
Um, there are many, as far as sort of studying for the LSAT, there are many um, preparation programs. LSAC a few years ago partnered with Khan Academy uh, to provide free test preparation. So you can download the Khan Academy app to your phone. Um, and they have actual LSAT exams that were administered in the past. So they offer practice exams um, and also different modules that you can go through for just test prep. So that's a, always a good option if you wanna self-study for the exam and find a free resource. Um, it does require you to be um, obviously monitoring your time. So you'll wanna make sure you build in time to do that and that you're really setting a schedule to do that studying as you would if you were paying for a prep program, which like assigns you homework every week and makes you take certain diagnostic tests throughout your time. Um, so Khan Academy, I think is great. Um, if you sort of have that discipline to be able to kind of set your own study schedule that works for some folks and not others. There are a lot of other test prep companies out there uh, offering services for various amounts. Um, many programs do offer discounts on those or offer free programs. Um, so definitely, you know, look into what your options are for that. Um, but in general, you'll want to start studying at least six months prior. Um, and that'll also depend on the kind of time you have available to study. Um, assuming most of you will be college students when you're applying, um, think about when that works best for you to study. Um, during the year, of course, you're going to have classes, you're going to be busy with all your extracurriculars and studying, and you're not going to have a whole lot of time to study. So if you're only able to carve out, you know, an hour a day, and then most of it's going to be on the weekends, um, you're going to want to spend more time studying. So that'll probably look more like about six months or so before you actually want to, you know, sit down and take the exam. Um, some people are able to carve out time in their schedules, like in the summer, for example, or after you graduate, you might have a month free or something um, where you don't have other things going on as much and you're able to like kind of full time study and they can compress that schedule down. Um, but for most folks, especially like if you're, you know, if you're having to work, if you're having to do school, uh, I would set aside at least six months to prepare for that. Um, and LSAC, again, on their website, they have the full schedule of when the LSAT is offered. Uh, it's a digital exam now, so you take it, um, most people are going to take it from their home. Um, and then it's offered um, multiple times, it's offered, uh, I don't know exactly, it's almost like 10 times a year, it's almost every month that it's offered. So it used to only be like four times a year. Um, so they've gotten a lot better about the frequency in which they offer it. Um, most people going into applying to law school um, plan to take it kind of the summer before they're looking to apply. So say you were applying to law school to start in 2023. Um, so you were going to start completing your applications in just a few months when the applications open. This summer would be a good time to, to, to register to actually take the LSAT. Uh, the reason being is that it takes about a month for you to get your score back and for schools to get your score. Um, and unfortunately, many people have to take it multiple times. Um, definitely, it's not a test to go in cold. You will want to, you know, study. You'll want to take at least four or five practice exams in a real, you know, timed test taking situation so that you can see sort of what you're scoring and if that um, comports with sort of the goals that you have. Um, or maybe you need to spend a little bit more time studying a particular section. Um, so definitely take some practice exams. Um, but sometimes people get their score back and they realize they want to retake the test. There are a number of reasons for that. You know, the test jitters are a real thing, test anxiety. <laughs> so sometimes you, you need to take it again. Um, maybe you weren't feeling well that day. Maybe you just felt rushed and you want to spend more time studying. So we usually recommend to build in a little bit of time for you to get your score back, assess if you do want to retake it, um, and that way you have time to retake the exam in the fall and still complete your application. So, um, so for timeline wise, yeah, so build in three to six months ahead of time to study, make sure you register for the exam, you do need to register a couple months ahead of time. Um, and then build in about a month for you to get your score back before you actually submit applications.
Okay, and then I had mentioned the CAS report, the Credentials Assembly Service Report. This is a report that LSAC creates and sends to each law school that you're going to apply to. So um, that's another reason that it's a good thing to set up your LSAC account in advance. And this is something that you can take care of um, in advance um, with sending your transcripts in. Um, so the LSAC requires you send in all transcript, transcripts basically besides high school. So community college transcripts, uh, if you transferred schools, if you studied abroad and that transcript is not included in your college transcript, we would they would require a separate transcript for that if the grades are not listed on the you know on your graduating uh, institution's transcript. Um, if you took a community college class while in high school, you would want to send that in. Basically, anything that you got a transcript and a grade for, except for your high school classes, you'll want to send all those in. It does take some time uh, for those transcripts to get sent in, somebody has to analyze them, and then they create a report which breaks down your grades into years so that we can see easily um, your grades from year to year. It also includes your cumulative GPA. That is going to be the, the GPA from all of the schools that you um, have attended. So for those of you that are community college transfer students, it would include both uh, your community college transcripts and your four-year degree um, GPA. Um, and it also has a degree GPA, which is the GPA from the school that you ultimately graduated with your bachelor's. So sometimes those are different for those that have, have moved around schools a lot. So they'll um, package this all together. It'll also have your LSAT score in there and your letters of recommendation as well. So um, you'll package that in there. Um, again, it is quite expensive, this process, just to register for the service is $195. And then for each school that you send it to, it's $45. Some schools do offer a CAS uh, fee waiver. Not all do, so that's something you'll want to see ahead of time. LSAC sometimes covers those fees as well if you're an LSAC fee waiver recipient. Um, so it'd be good to have a spreadsheet with sort of what's covered. And that's also a good reason to kind of think, um, think a lot about where you're going to be applying. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, it, it's expensive to apply to each law school. So I, I hear a lot of people on panels say like, apply to as many schools as you can. Like, and personally, like that's not a strategy I would recommend employing uh, for a number of reasons. Not one of them being financial reasons is, you know, each of those schools are not free. Even if they're giving you an application fee waiver, you may still have to pay to send a CAS report because a lot of schools don't offer the CAS fee waiver. Um, and number two, personally, I think it's better to have a smaller set of schools and really put in a lot of time and effort to applying to those law schools rather than apply to say 20 or 30 schools and just not really realize maybe you've missed deadlines or maybe you haven't included certain materials. So I always think like quality is better than quantity. Um, but that's a little bit about the CAS report and transcripts process. Okay, and then I had mentioned the LSAC fee waiver. Um, so I would definitely recommend applying for the LSAC fee waiver if you feel like you may be eligible. Um, on their website, uh, they list the eligibility requirements. Um, and you'll wanna do this ahead of time so that you um, already have the fee waiver ready to go um, in the application year that you're applying to law school. So for those of you that are a few years off, you don't, don't apply now, but you would apply in the, the application cycle that you would be um, actually submitting your applications in. Um, so it gives uh, two free LSATs within a two year period. Um, so that's really great because I said a lot of, I would say it's pretty normal for people to take it two times. If you're able to take it one time and get that score you're looking for, that's great. Um, 
but most people do want to at least have a backup of being able to take it a second time if they need to. So I would say two, two LSAT administrations is pretty common. It covers the writing section, which is also a required part of the LSAT. Uh, so you'll sit to take the, the, the digital LSAT, um, and once you're actually done with the test, there's a separate writing portion that you need to do. And that is important because schools do look at that just to kind of see a quick you know, um, glance at you know, how you write under in a timed environment, knowing that you only have a short amount of time to write a written piece. Uh, so definitely take that, that seriously. Um, and it covers your CAS registration fee, and it covers um, three to six CAS law school reports, um, and also some, sub, sub, oh, I'm sorry, some subscriptions to other LSAC services like LSAT Plus Prep and Score Preview. Score Preview is a paid option um, where you can actually see preview your score before it's actually released to schools. And I think they give you two or three days to cancel the score if you would like. Um, so that way you can kind of, you can preview it and cancel if you want to. So that's also included in the fee waiver. Okay, so now we, you're sort of done with the LSAC portion. Let's talk about the actual applications um, that you will complete for each law school. Um, and this is this is the easy part, <laughs> but it's actually this this part is really <laughs> important. I wouldn't say necessarily easy, but um, it might be easier to navigate perhaps than LSAC's process. Um, so LSAC hosts all of the law school applications on their website. So you won't be going to each individual's law school to apply. Uh, you would select in there which law schools you're looking to apply through, and then you would go through each school's application electronically on the LSAC website and submit it to the school. And then that information gets sent electronically through our database to, to you know, each school that you apply for so that we can see that you've applied in your application components. Um, I mentioned the LSAC fee waiver. Um, a lot, most law schools also offer their own fee waiver. Uh, there's different criteria for this. Some schools will offer it only like they, they will send out emails to people that they deem eligible with whatever criteria they're using. Again, it's a good re reason to sign up for the CR, um, CRS. The, uh, the candidate referral service so that you might receive some of those fee waivers. Some of you have, some of them have a form that you have to fill out. Some of them, if you just email them with your information asking for either um, for financial need or based on academic merit or whatever your particular circumstances are, um, and they'll just email you. So this one is kind of tricky. Like you'll want to look just for each school. At the end of the day, you can always just email the school and they'll let you know their process for fee waivers. I will say if you received the LSAC fee waiver, it's automatically going to zero out your application fee when you go to apply for the school. So if you received the LSAC fee waiver and it's, it's one of the schools that you're using to cover that with, uh, you don't need the law school to send you a fee waiver as well. Um, and then again, just talking about costs, when you're putting together your spreadsheet and thinking about your finances and how much all of this is going to cost, um, most law school applications are between 60 to $100 each to apply to. Um, some of them have programs where like if you apply by a certain date, generally it's earlier, if you, like if you apply by December 1st, the fee waiver is waived or the fee is waived. Some of them, like if you apply to their early decision program, the fee is waived. So, and of course you can always ask for that fee waiver, but other than that, um, you'll want to factor in how much each application will cost. Okay, so now let's talk about, I think more of the fun, the fun things um, or the things that are really more individual to you and that you have full control over. Um, once, you know, once you've graduated, once you've had your GPA, you can't go back and change that. Um, the LSAT, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't tell us anything at all about who you are as a person and an individual and your background and contributions. 
So the narrative piece of the application is really where you can, you know, quote unquote, sell yourself to the school, tell them more about you. It's really the personal, you know, pieces of the application. And it's my, you know, favorite parts to read are the personal statement. That's generally like when I'm opening up an application, I I don't really look at the cast report yet. I start with the application materials you've submitted um, to kind of get a sense of who you are. Um, and hopefully if like, if I'm impressed by that, if I really um, like your materials, I can see that, you know, you're a great student, what con kind of contribution you'd make to the law school. Then I would open up the CAS report and kind of take a look at the LSAT and your grades and things like that. So think of these narrative pieces almost as like an introduction to who you are. So you're going to want to make those compelling so that um, especially if like if your LSAT's a little bit lower maybe than the median or your GPA is a little bit lower, um, anything like that so that you're you're basically telling the school why they should admit you. So the personal statement and the resume, um, I'm going to talk about that I think on the next slide a little bit more about what those are. Um, and most schools um, have a pretty generic personal statement. Some schools do ask a specific question that they want you to answer. But for the most part, you can think about this as an essay between two to four pages generally about who you are as a person. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be about why law school, what you want to do in law school. In fact, I really encourage you to be more reflective and kind of look at yourself up until this point. What do you want law school admission officers to know about you? Um, and then the resume. The resume is going to be usually one to two pages. Again, some schools have specific limits or are looking for different kinds of things. So just check with each school for what their resume requirement are most of the time, one to two pages. Um, and it's going to list out all of your experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be professional, legal experience. We want to know everything that you're doing, extracurriculars, internships, volunteering, paid positions, how many hours those were, all of your commitments so that we get a nice um, kind of view of what you were involved in. It's also nice to have that when we're reviewing transcripts as well so that we can sort of assess, oh wow, this, you know, this student was not only balancing classes, they were also working 30 hours a week through college. So I always say don't self, you know, don't self-select, um, self-edit on the resume, include everything on there. Um, there are also a number of addenda. So most of these are optional. Some of them are required. Um, I'll talk about those in a little bit as well and what those look like. Um, and so those are sort of just ways to think about when you're kind of going through and just starting to draft, even just starting to make general lists maybe of like, these are the things I really want to cover. You'll want to think about where everything fits in each of these. Not everything has to go in the personal statement. If a school lets you use addenda, you might want to consider using a diversity statement or like a Y X law school statement to cover some of these other pieces so that you can fo a little, focus a little more in the personal statement. So um, it's good just to kind of start thinking about everything. And then once you actually start writing, you can think, okay, actually this might kind of be a good thing to put separately here. And then as it says at the bottom, practice makes perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, definitely have mentors um, read through these materials. Um, I also recommend like people, have people that maybe don't know you very well, read through them as well if you feel comfortable with that. Um, just to kind of get, you know, see what their reaction is, what their um, sense of you as an applicant is, just knowing that the admissions officers that are reading these applications are not gonna know you at all. So, um, so have people that both know you pretty well and maybe some people that are a little bit more removed, like maybe an academic advisor or some, somebody like that, somebody who you would entrust that's a good writer um, to read through them and get their opinion as well. Okay, so the personal statement, as I mentioned, for most schools, it's going to be um, between two to four pages. Some schools have a strict two page limit. Um, some schools like Berkeley Law allow four pages. So you're gonna wanna um, see for each school you're applying to what their requirement is. And you may wanna write a couple of different versions of your personal statement so that you can have maybe a longer one and a more succinct one that's in two pages. And again, just figure out if they allow addenda so that 
those things that you're not covering in the personal statement, maybe you can fit them elsewhere in your application. And then what is in the personal statement? Um, first off, it's different than a statement of purpose. A statement of purpose is what you might apply for with like a master's or a PhD program where they ask you, you know, what are, um, what are your, your fields of study? What do you want to do with this degree? What faculty do you want to work in? And what do you want to do after school? Um, so that's a statement of purpose. That is not what we're looking for. Um, the personal statement should really be more of a personal piece. It should be more reflective of who you are as a person. So you can talk about why you want to go to law school, especially if it does relate back to something personal that's happened to you. Many students do talk about that, um, but it's not necessary. You really just get looking to get a good sense of who you are in this process. Um, you can certainly touch on, um, you know, how you, you know, what you would like to add uh, to the legal profession as a whole. Um, but in general, it should be reflective. It should be kind of looking back at your time rather than a whole, you know, essay about what you want to do in law school. And this is the impact I want to have, um, which is great, but it just doesn't tell me like much about what you've already done. So I always say like, be reflective and really think about ways instead of just using adjectives like think about stories you can really tell us that kind of show you know what your interests are what you're passionate about um what kind of person you are um i think in the next slide if we want to go to the next slide i'll kind of talk about some of the questions or, or topics you could start thinking about as you go to start drafting your statement um and, and so kind of think about going through these um, and just kind of creating a list at first. Um, and then you can start, you know, making connections, putting these together to think about um, a few points that you really want to focus on. Uh, so these are the kind of questions you can start asking yourself, you know, like, why is law school right for you? Um, in what ways will having you in the in the classroom or at this particular school make a difference? Um, do you have a strong potential for leadership? Um, how is your academic achievement remarkable? You know, are you a first generation college student having to pay your way through college? Um, you know, why do you want to attend a specific law school? Um, and this again, a lot of schools offer this, you know, why, like a why Berkeley law statement where you can talk about that specific law school. And sometimes it might be more appropriate to put it there than trying to fit that in your personal statement, which is really talking more about you as a person. So don't feel like this all has to go in the personal statement. Um, what would we want to know about you that maybe we wouldn't be able to tell from the rest of your application? Um, many law schools don't offer interviews, some do. Berkeley Law, for example, doesn't offer any kind of, you know, personal interviews. So everything that you want the admissions committee to know about you should be somewhere in the written piece of your application. So think about those kind of things of, you know, what, you know, what makes you different from the, you know, thousands of other people that are going to be applying. Um, and then what else can you tell us, you know, why did you decide to pick up that particular major or um, why did you decide to pursue, you know, that internship? So one thing that's not helpful is um, sort of a resume in essay form. Sometimes we see this where somebody is like, you know, first paragraph, this is, I've always wanted to go to law school, or this is the thing that makes me want to go to law school. Um, then this is the internship that I did. Then I did this other internship and then I majored in this in college and then kind of wrapping it up at the end. Now, like, please admit me to your law school. Um, well, that, you know, that is somewhat helpful information. Again, it doesn't tell me anything specifically about, about you as a person. So you're definitely welcome to touch on those points or touch on something that you did in your resume, like an internship or, or your major or class project, but just make sure you're really delving deep into that subject to tell me more about you know, direction. So just make sure you're going more in depth than just sort of that cursory, you know, these are the things that I've done and now I want to go to law school. Oh. 
Okay, and then I talked about some of these other addenda that you can submit. Um, so uh, required addenda, um, if you answer any questions in the application where they say you need to attach um, an explanation of some sort, generally these are going to be what we call the character and fitness questions. Um, most law schools are required to answer Um, and they ask many more questions than the law school does. So they'll want to see how you answered those questions in your law school application. So that's why if you do answer yes to any of the questions, and they are going to be different depending on the school and depending on the state. Um, so just read them carefully what they're asking. Um, but make sure you do submit those statements. Um, if you're not really sure, we always recommend erring on the side of disclosure, um, or you can always contact the school about your specific situation if you need. Statements don't need to be particularly lengthy, like with, you know, within a paragraph or two, most you know, places also don't require like specific documentation either. They just want to hear sort of in your own words, you know, what was the situation? What happened? When did it happen? What did you learn from that situation? So this is a little bit of a nuanced category. So, you know, if, if this applies to you, I definitely recommend being proactive and reaching out to schools in advance to get advice from them about how you might craft this. And again, talking with mentors, um, practicing attorneys, anybody that you know that might also be able to provide advice and sort of have them read through it and, and get their feedback. So it absolutely, you know, doesn't preclude you from getting admitted. Most of the time, like we see a lot of people who, you know, got, you know, a noise um, infraction in the dorms or something like that. Um, so we see a lot of people that also have like misdemeanors of, of um, various sorts um, that do extremely well in law school as well. Um, and so uh, don't feel like this is going to preclude you at all. It just needs to be addressed in there and it's sometimes sensitive subject. So it's best to kind of reach out in those cases. Um, other kinds of agenda you might wanna submit, um, at something about your GPA, academic record. If, if, you know, if there are anything in, when we're looking at a transcript that might raise an eyebrow, like oh, wow, there's like a two-year gap here. I wonder what they were doing in that time. Or, wow, this student was doing so well, and then there's a semester where they, you know, failed classes. I wonder what happened there. Anything like that, any outliers in grades, anything that would require additional context, um, rigor of the major. Maybe you were in like a very difficult STEM major that, you know, imposed a, a really harsh curve. And so even though your GPA for this class doesn't look great, you were actually in the top 10%. Anything like that, you're welcome to submit a short statement about your LSAT score as well. Um, your general history of, of uh, standardized testing, we realize it's non-predictive for many people who just don't perform well on, you know, maybe the SAT or the ACT if you took that for college. Um, but you were a really great student and you ended up doing really well. So definitely advocate for yourself. And um, if there's anything about the LSAT, standardized testing in general, you're welcome to submit addenda on those. Um, and then look if there's some schools have other things like the, you know, why law school statement, um, diversity statements, things like that that they offer. So just look at those and again, see if those are applicable for you. If you've maybe talked about them in the personal statement, it might not be um, needed that you submit an additional statement, but you have that space if you would like to. And then letters of recommendation. Um, law, most law schools are going to require letters of recommendation. Um, most are going to require one to two academic letters. So these would be from um, professors or TAs, GSIs, who have actually you know, see, had you in their class and seen you in an academic environment. Um, and then you're also able to submit professional letters, which are 
um, generally like your manager from like an internship or a job, something of that nature. So this is something you can start working on now. Um, for those of you that are still kind of early on in the process in college, think about trying to get to know a couple of professors um, well so that they can write strong letters for you. Um, if there's a professor you like, maybe consider, you know, taking a couple of classes with them so that they see you over a few different semesters. Um, or consider maybe doing a research project or independent research and honors thesis. These are great ways to get to know faculty more one on one, especially if you're at like a larger school like UC Berkeley. Um, it's hard to get to know those professors in some of the larger classes. Um, and it's intimidating to go to office hours sometimes, you know, especially for first gen students like you're like, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know what I should be asking them. So maybe just try to like force yourself to, you know, try to just go like once at the beginning of the semester and see how it goes and maybe start setting those more regularly so that you do get to know um, faculty. Um, so when it comes time to write your letters, they're able to do so. Um, it's always good to get those by the time you graduate, um, even if you're not thinking about applying to law school for a little bit of time, maybe you're going to work for a few years and then apply. It's really difficult to get those academic letters if you've been out of school for a few years. Um, professors move, you know, might have moved on, they might have retired, they might not remember you very well. So it's better to just get it while, you know, they're, you're, you're still kind of fresh in their minds. Um, and have them, they'll upload it electronically to your LSAC account. And they'll, LSAC will store those for up to five years. So it's absolutely fine if you end up applying a few years out to use those letters. You don't need to go back and ask them to update those. Um, and then of course you can supplement with maybe like one professional letter. If you have a, you know, somebody, your manager that knows you well, um, that's important. Uh, the person that knows you well, you don't need to go to like the CEO of the company and ask for a letter if you've never really interacted with that person. Sometimes we see letters like that from like, um, like a senator who you've, maybe you interned in their office, but you, they never really like worked with you one on one, it might be better to get it from your direct manager in that case. So we do not care about titles at all. It's more about the content. So ask the person who knows you the best. Um, set early deadlines, allow at least a month for them to complete the letter, um, and you'll probably want to set a reminder to just check that they've uploaded it, um, and do the hard work for them. Create kind of a packet of material you can give them um, with like your resume, maybe a little um, cover letter about, you know, why you're applying to law school, if you want to share the law schools you're thinking about applying to. Um, if, you're, if you feel comfortable with it, you can share your personal statement. Um, remind them of like the work that you did in a class or if it's a professional letter like some of the projects that you took on and you can also kind of touch on specific things maybe that they could talk about like oh I felt like these were my top three accomplishments or um, things like that so that they have a kind of a good base on what they can write their letter about because they are going to be I mean they're asked um, so many times to write letters. So it's always good to kind of do the hard work up front to get the best results when it comes to the letters. Um, and then academic record, I think I kind of already touched on most of this when I talked about the uh, credential assembly service report, you're going to want to submit um, transcripts from um, all classes. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, just allow some time, especially if it's an international transcript, um, they, that has to go through a separate process with LSAC. So build in time, um, for you to get those transcripts in so that you have kind of the CAS report ready to go. Uh, for those of you that might be applying in your senior year of college, you're obviously not gonna have those grades yet. So you can, I would apply with everything that you have up until the time you're applying. And then if you're applying say in the fall semester, um, you can just email schools a copy of your fall transcript when those come out in December um, and send it into LSAC, they'll send us an updated report, but generally we wanna see those as soon as possible. So if you're a senior applying, you can just email us the, that like unofficial copy of your transcript so we can take a look at your fall grades. And then 
I think this is my last slide or almost my last slide. So <laughs> I apologize. I've been talking at you for a long time now. So bear with me for just another couple of minutes. Um, so as I mentioned, sort of this just a timeline for applying, um, you're going to want to start about at least a year ahead of time, just sort of thinking the, these general questions. Is law school right? What would I want to do with a law degree? What kind of law school do I see myself at? Starting to come up, up with your list of schools and their requirements and deadlines so that you're prepared to apply in the year that you're, you're actually you know, looking to apply for law school. Uh, you're going to want to start studying for the LSAT um, so that you have time to prepare, take practice exams, register for the LSAT. Um, and then uh, taking the LSAT a few months before you're looking to apply, getting that score back. Um, and then hopefully kind of once you're done with the L, you know, studying for the LSAT, taking the LSAT, you can focus your attention on those narrative pieces. Um, this is a big piece of advice, like make sure you build in time to work on those. Sometimes we see students that like solely focus on the LSAT and then you can tell they really rush to put together all of the written pieces like right by the school's deadline. So um, make sure you're really spending time on those drafts and getting some good feedback so you feel really confident. Like that should be the strongest thing in your application, should never be your GPA or LSAT. It should be you feeling really com uh, confident um, with the written pieces. So make sure time you're putting, make sure you're setting aside time to do that. Um, so that then when the applications open, you can decide when is a good time to apply for those law school programs. And why is this timeline important? Um, one of the things, <laughs> one of the reoccurring themes of this presentation is the costs associated with law school and just applying to law school. Um, and so we've done a little breakdown here of, um, you know, if you go ahead and uh, fill out your LSAC um, account, um, apply to the fee waiver ahead of time. Um, and if you're applying to nine law schools, we have the column here on the right side, which shows the total cost um, for those. Um, and then the cost on the left hand side is maybe you kind of leave it too late. You don't have time to apply for the LSAC fee waiver and you're ending up having to pay out of pocket. As you can see, it's very different. So as much as you can do ahead of time, it will both save you stress later on in the process, um, but it will also save you money in the process as well. So use all of those resources, um, everything that's given so that you can save as much money as you can. Okay, and then this is my last slide, I believe. So I'm almost done. <laughs> um, so again, yeah, why is the timeline important? Um, and I kind of left off on this on the last slide as far as when you're actually submitting your applications. But most law schools use a rolling admissions process um, for the applications, which means that we don't wait until the deadline to start reviewing applications. We start reviewing them as soon as you submit. Um, so keep in mind, most law school applications are going to open in September. So it's to your benefit to try to apply earlier on if, you, if you're able to, which again, which is why the preparation is so important so that hopefully you could try to apply um, by like the, by December is a good rule of thumb. Most law schools will consider that on the earlier side. The reason for that is that at that point, generally, we haven't really started admitting students. So we have all of our seats in our class available um, and we don't have as many applications. Many people wait until the deadline to apply. If you're waiting until later when that law school's application is um, coming up and those most uh, deadlines are somewhere between February to April. Some schools even have later deadlines like in May or June. Um, but I would target to like somewhere in February or March is pretty common. If you're waiting until that time, you're going to be competing with a greater number of students and schools have already started admitting some of their classes. So they have less seats available. So it just becomes a little bit more competitive the longer you wait to apply. So you'll want to look at that and kind of figure out what is your target date for applying to each school. Some schools also have different deadlines for early decision. 
Um, you'll see that when you start researching schools. If you do, if there is like a school that becomes a really top choice that you want to see if they have an early decision option, that might be a good um, option for you. Some people don't want to do early decision either. There are, there are, you know, kind of positives and negatives to early decisions. So just look at that, especially financial reasons. So see if like scholarships are associated with applying early decision. Um, but that has a different deadline. Um, certain school scholarships have a different deadline. For example, at Berkeley Law, we offer the Opportunity Scholarship, which is our full tuition scholarship for first generation college grads. Um, and that has a December 15th deadline. So just make sure, again, you're noting that on your spreadsheet so that you, if you're first gen and you're applying for that scholarship, which you absolutely should, you're making sure you're, you're meeting that deadline. Um, and just make sure you're going in when the application's open to start looking through them and at least starting that process in October of, of starting to go through the application, even if you don't actually submit it in October. And I think that's the end of, of my portion. I'm happy to answer more questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Maida. But thank you all for putting your questions in the chat. Please continue to do so. We'll be um, addressing some more questions at the end. Um, if there's any small questions, we'll try to address them just by typing out the answer. But yeah, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Maida and we'll spend at least the last five-ish minutes um, doing the feedback survey and getting to your questions. Um, but yeah, also, if you get nervous about having a lot of questions, you can always email contact at centralvalleyscholars.org and we can try to connect you with someone. Um, but with that, uh, Maida, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Katya, and thank you, Alice. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Myra. So just some quick disclaimers. I live next to a very busy road. So sometimes you might hear traffic sounds, ignore, it'll, it'll pass. I also have a dog. He's currently sleeping, so let's hope it stays that way. Um, so when I planned out my slides, I wasn't quite sure who the audience would be. It kind of seems like it, it might be geared more towards undergrad students, either people about to graduate or still in the thick of it. Um, so I'll keep that in mind um, as I go through this slide. I did go to Harvard for undergrad. Um, so it was a while ago. I graduated in 2016. So I was there from 2012 to 2016. Um, for people in the chat right now, I'm not sure at what stage in your undergrad career you are, but something that I thought of, I was one of those students that like in high school, I did mock trial and I was like, I want to be a lawyer. So I always had that in the back of my mind. And so one thing that's very important when you, if you think that law school is in your future, not to base your entire decision off of that, but to keep in mind how important um, choosing your major and your GPA is. Because um, when we're thinking about a law school application, there are, so, there are more subjective parts, right? Like interviews, uh, personal statement, letters of rec. But there are two hard, hard, fast, concrete numbers um, that the admissions officer will always see, which is your LSAT score and your GPA. Obviously, GPA is very tied to your major. Um, I studied sociology in undergrad. I chose it, honestly, because I loved sociology. And my perspective was, if it is a subject matter that I love and that I care about, I'm going to do well. And actually that that sort of worked out for me. Um, I did take, I did towards the end of um, my college career challenge myself a little bit and took like some engineering courses, which I think kind of like spiced up the resume a little bit. But I was, I, I would be lying if I, if I didn't say that. Um, knowing I was applying to law school wasn't a factor in, in my major and my GPA. Extracurriculars, super important. Um, so one, like probably the extracurricular that I was the most devoted to throughout undergrad was my job, um, which is not really an extracurricular, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is um, for students from certain backgrounds, like you, you might need a job. And so I had, 
I don't think my entire time at Harvard, I there was never a time where I didn't have three jobs. So some of I worked um, in the admissions office for a while. I worked like in the the retail store, but the job that I loved the most um, was working as a barista at a student cafe, and I it actually came up a lot in. Um, interviews, not just for law school admissions, but even jobs afterwards, um, just in terms of like social, social skills and um, how I prefer to interact. And it was, I think it was just an interesting thing for people to see on my resume. Um, in addition to that, I also um, did some more by the book cookie cutter extracurriculars. So like one of them would be, um, I was a volunteer as a mentor at a youth prison. So I worked um, in a mentorship capacity for student, for young kids, some of them students um, that were in the carceral system. So that had a more of a, you, you can see how that connects a little bit more to my interest in law. Um, Alice mentioned um, letters of recommendation. This was something that I, I, I heard so many people, you know, give me the advice that Alice gave today on the webinar, and I wish I would have listened to more of it because I was definitely that person three years, four years after the fact. I waited four years after I graduated to finally apply. Um, so by that time, the person that I had in mind that I really wanted to write my letter of recommendation wasn't even at Harvard anymore. Um, they were at another university. And so I definitely had to do some legwork in, in tracking her down. Um, but for, for those of you that are still currently in undergrad, um, I think one really great way to tee this up for yourself is if you are writing a thesis because that is a, an advisor that you will likely work, um, work with very closely. You will spend a lot of hours with them and they'll, they'll get to know you um, at, a, at a more intimate level. I didn't write a senior thesis, so I kind of very much felt myself in a bind. I just kind of thought of, okay, what is a class that I did well in and that the class was smaller? So that sort of increases the chances of that professor or that TA um, remembering you and having good things to say about you. And um, even, even if, like for example, for me, it was four years after the fact, I would do random things. Like I remember one time this professor was working on some on research and I happened to hear the research referenced on an NPR podcast, I love NPR. I quickly Googled like her email and sent her a quick email and said, hey, hope you're doing well. Like I heard about your research and da 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 da. Just a way to sort of keep those connections going, especially if you think that you might not be applying right away from undergrad. Um, you wanna make sure you're sort of building in those touchbacks. It can feel very weird. I know that that part of like the networking and, and developing sort of that mentorship relationship. Um, it's taken me a couple of years for it to feel organic. Um, but one thing I will say, and I, people told me this and I wish I would have believed it, part of the, part of professors, TA's roles are to write letters of recommendation. You are not a burden. This is very much an expected part of, of their role in their position. Um, and so trying to sometimes push past that like that queasy feeling where like you don't you don't want to be a burden, you don't want them to like look at you weird or feel like why would this person think they like try to dispel that. Um, because that's, that's part of why they're there. They're supposed to be a support network, help you develop into professionals. Um, I'll, I'll quickly touch on like the decision to go straight through from undergrad to law school versus working a few years. Um, I have a number of friends that went straight through and um, like I'm 27 years old right now. So I have friends that are that have been in the workforce for two, three years. Um, and so there was definitely a little bit of pressure that I felt to do that as well, especially coming um, from like a, a first gen immigrant family. There's sometimes it can be harder to communicate to family members the concept of a gap year, the concept of um, 
work experience and waiting until you're ready. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of difficult things about being first gen and that's just part of it. Um, I think honoring your honoring yourself and really thinking about like your motivations for going straight through from undergrad, if that's something you, you're considering. And a lot of cases, I know people that were in which because of a lot of factors, like that was the only way to do it. For me, originally, I'd only plan on taking two years. And then I felt like after two years in the workforce, I just felt that I mentally wasn't wasn't where I wanted to be in terms of being able to truly take advantage of like the law school experience. So I waited another two years. So then it was four years before I actually applied. And then the pandemic happened. So that four years turned into six years. Um, so I have what some people might call a little bit of a non-traditional path to law school. And if people have questions about timing, um, is it too late? Am I too old? Like I'm, I'm going to be 31 when I graduate and I'm just going to have to own that because that is what it is. Um, and so I, I can talk on that a little bit more. I will say personally, I wouldn't do it any other way. Sure, I like I would have loved for COVID not to happen. And then, you know, I would have gone in 2020. Um, but I would have given the choice to go straight from undergrad or work for a couple of years. 10 times out of 10, I'm choosing to work. Um, I think it gives you great perspective. I think that I am as opposed to some students that I know that are starting law school in August, I'm very excited actually to be a student again. Um, I think when you, you're in the workforce, you realize that a lot of the things we moan and groan about, about school um, with the right perspective, it's actually like the most exciting thing ever. Um, and I think now also after having been in the workforce, I just, I've worked past a lot of like the imposter syndrome. Um, I'm very clear on what I want to get out of the experience. Um, and I think I'm not so as easily intimidated or phased. So I am always a proponent of taking one year, two years, six years, whatever you need. Um, Katia, you can go to the next slide. Please. Cool. So just to um, let you know a little bit about what I was doing over those six years. So my very first job, um, out of college was at a law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. It's, I think, currently ranked number four. It's a very prestigious, what's called a big law firm. Um, I worked there for two years. And then I worked, I've always, academically, I've always felt like um, a passion towards research and social science. And so after Sullivan and Cromwell, I spent two years at Trial Behavior Consulting. They, uh, Trial Behavior Consulting uh, does jury consulting. Um, and so imagine like social science to help lawyers. So we would help them depending on a case, help them choose a venue, help them choose a jury that we felt based on various social science and behavioral norms that we felt would be um, more agreeable to, to whoever had hired us. Um, and then actually, I in 2020, I moved back home. I moved back to the Valley and I worked at the city of Lindsay, which is a small town of about 13,000 people. Um, I worked there as an executive projects manager in the city manager's department. Um, great experience, absolutely loved my time in Lindsay. And then just last Friday, I finished up my summer internship at Kirkland and Ellis. Kirkland and Ellis is another uh, big law firm, corporate law firm. Um, and I was working there as a summer associate, actually, even though I haven't even started law school. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the SEO Law Fellowship. Through this program, I was able to work as a summer associate with two L's and three L's. So current law students um, that went through uh, on-campus interviews, very selective process to get placed in these law firms. Um, so it was a really great way to get a leg up. I think that work experience um, when you're applying to law school is great because in addition to extracurriculars helping you stand out and your personal statement helping you stand out, you can stand out as a candidate who has 
who has a skill set, who has proven themselves to um, be somebody that knows their way around an office that can, um, you know, depending on what you're doing. I was working in, in a law firm in one capacity, but then at a city in another. And so the different skill sets that both of those experiences gave me that I can bring that now as a student on campus. Um, it's going to inform the way I interact in a classroom. It's going to inform the way um, the leadership positions that I might take. And so I think a work experience is really great for helping you uh, stand out. Also, a lot of these experiences that I had, although obviously I wasn't a lawyer, they were law adjacent. So I got to actually see like the good, the bad and the ugly of this profession and decide, okay, is this still something that you wanna pursue? Um, and I definitely saw some ugly parts and the fact that I'm still committed to this profession makes me feel a lot more confident about going to law school, taking out those loans and like knowing that this is the right path for me. Um, something to keep in mind also are if you're working, finding the time to study for the LSAT. I know people that studied and worked at the same time. I cannot imagine doing that. Hats off to them. What I did was I actually, between the two years that I spent at Sullivan and Cromwell and the two years that I um, worked at Trial Behavior Consulting, that summer, I took that summer off uh, and I'll explain, I did a, a program that essentially helped me study for the LSAT. I think that program um, called Trials is probably, if I could credit it's never that simple, right? But if I could like credit one experience, one thing with helping me get to this point to Harvard Law School, it would be trials. Um, it, it has been the most consequential experience that, that I've had. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then another thing to, to consider if you have work experience is you can add in a professional letter of recommendation. So I mentioned that I was four years out even though I was four years out, law schools are always going to want to see at least one let academic letter of recommendation from a professor, from a TA. That is almost non-negotiable. Even if you've been out of school for a while, like I was, they expect you to reach out and, and get that academic letter of recommendation. I, however, because it was so far out, I was like, I can get one. I don't know if I can get two. So, what I did in my law school applications process, I submitted one academic letter and then one professional letter. So I, somebody that I worked with, that I knew had great things to say about me um, as a worker, and that worked for me. Katia, next slide, please. Okay, trials. Okay, so trials, as I mentioned, um, I could talk forever about trials but i'll just take you through the nuts and bolts of it and then a little bit about a little bit more about what it meant to me personally so trials is a partnership between the advantage testing foundation which is a nonprofit, a philanthropic uh, foundation harvard law school and nyu school of law it is five weeks all expenses paid summer program for underrepresented students. And that is underrepresented students in the law specifically. Um, it provides an, in, an intensive LSAT prep course. It's an extremely selective program. Only 20 students are selected each year. Offers great networking and mentorship opportunities. So this program um, is not just for undergrad students, although I will say that in my year, my cohort, most students were either rising seniors or had just graduated. I was definitely the oldest person in that program as somebody that had already been in the workforce. Um, but even then, like I was still somebody that um, was eligible for this program because this program is very much geared towards students that might count themselves out from applying to certain type of law schools. Um, the LSAT can be a very daunting test. I think, I think that's honestly one of the greatest barriers to entry in terms of like, do I wanna go to law school? Can I do it? The LSAT is just such a specific type of test that you need to study for that you could be the smartest person in the world 
And if you sit down to take an LSAT and you have never been introduced to the format before, you've never had any type of training or advice on it, it's going to be difficult. And so it is very much the type of program or the type of test that you need to spend a lot of time with, getting familiar with. It's gonna be intimidating at first and working out those kinks, like uh, work, chipping away at like the intimidating structure of it is so important. The reason why trials I think worked so well for me and for others is that it's only 20 students, it's five weeks, you live, you breathe, you study the LSAT with 19 other students. And so whenever, inevitably, whenever you're like, oh my gosh, this is so hard, I can't do this, I'm never going to law school. There are 19 other people that are in the trenches with you. Um, the other thing that was super consequential for me about trials is that I don't know how I did it. It's insane that I went from high school to Harvard to four years in the workforce. And this was the, the trials was the first time that I truly felt like, oh, this is what effective mentorship looks like. It was the first time that I connected with adults that had walked the path that I did, that I wanted to walk, um, that had done the things that I wanted to do, that shared a lot of my identities and that genuinely wanted to help me and not just in a, oh yes, like come to my office hours way, but in a, I will invest in you because I believe in you way. It is up until that point, I felt like mentorship, mentors, da, 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 I felt like it was buzzwords. This was the first time that I lived and breathed it. Um, and I, like I said, if I had to, if I had to narrow down, like how I got to this point, Harvard Law School, it would be trials. Um, so I very much encourage anybody interested to research this program. Um, if you have questions about it, you can reach out to me. I am like the number one cheerleader of this program. Katia, next slide, please. Okay. And then just another program that I want to put on people's radar um, for those that eventually, whether in this year or coming years, do apply to law school, um, the SEO Law Fellowship Program. This is a program that you apply to after being accepted to law school. Um, and it is designed to offer big law summer internships to students before they even start law school. These big law summer internships are so competitive. They are so, so competitive for actual law students that most actual law students actually don't even get a big law summer internship until the, their 2L summer. So if you can get that on your resume before you ever even enter law school, it is such a leg up. Um, you're getting your foot in the door early. You're getting practical experience and mentorship. Um, I finished up my SEO law program and I literally have a list of contacts of people that are in this field that I can, that are now uh, potential mentors for me. So for example, two weeks ago, I attended, I attended a um, Latinx mixer event, met this great person who's working in real estate law, which is something I think I might be interested in reached out to them and I have a Zoom coffee chat scheduled with them tomorrow. So it's a great way to get some FaceTime um, with people that can really help you guide and orient you through your law school journey and through your legal career. I think for, I think law as a profession is so, I mean, it's, it's changing, but it's still, it's fairly like traditional, um, archaic in some ways. So I really think, um, mentorship and having people sort of be able to to reach reach down and carry you up carry people up with them is very important um so this program that does a great job at facilitating those type of interactions um and as i mentioned having this on your resume will definitely help you stand out during on-campus interviews once you're actually in law school um, but that is that is more of a light at the end of the tunnel type experience. So I won't spend very much more time on that. Um, Katia, I think that was all the slides I had presented or, or I had prepared to present. Um, I know that we have some questions in the chat. I don't know, Katia, if you want to read those off or if I just go, launch right into it. How, how would yes, you no, absolutely. So we do have, I think we'll what we'll do since we are at time and then Maida and Alice, feel free to step off 
um, or hop off the Zoom call if needed. I will stay on for a little bit longer because we have some really great questions. So we'll start with the ones that are not answered, and then I'll probably go back and read through some of the ones that we were able to address. Um, that way we can just have that Q&A in the recording, uh, but still keeping it anonymous, of course. Um, but yes, thank you, Alice and Maida, so much. Feel free to hop off at any point. I will be staying on for a little bit longer. Um, but for starters, we have some questions from Maida, starting with how many times did you take the LSAT uh, and how many hours a day would you study? What was your schedule like? Um, if you could speak more to that. Yeah. So I took the LSAT two times. Um, I took it once, and this is kind of a fairly, from what I've learned from other people that applied to law school, um, I actually scored a few points lower than most practice tests I was taking. And that is kind of a common story. Um, so, but I was, I was I was not okay with that, and I wanted to take it and um, take it another time, see if I could do better and hit my target scores. Um, when I took it the second time was when they had just done the switch to digital, so it was in a hybrid format. You showed up the day of, and you didn't know if you were going to get the paper version or the tablet version. And so, obviously, up until that point, I'd only studied on the paper version. My luck, I show up, I get the tablet version. And so I actually did worse the second time around. I made use of what Alice mentioned, the score preview. I went ahead and canceled that score and I stuck with my original one. Um, so, you know, there's no shame in doing that. No shame whatsoever. I, I tell people that all the time and it's fine. Um, what prep programs did I utilize? Um, so I mentioned that I, um, you, I was part of uh, the trials um, program. And so that was five weeks of intensive study. Um, and then we returned home and I kept studying on my own. And so I would say that the structure for trials and the structure that I felt works best for me and, and that I recommend to everybody is it is absolutely imperative to do practice tests, full practice tests. That can be so annoying to build into your schedule. Um, I actually, not on, not only annoying, but I would I would get anxiety. Like I would be at a library or sitting down in my in my bedroom and sit down to a time test and freak out. And like I I didn't like it, but it's so important because you need to, as much as possible to try to replicate those day of the um, test day of scenario and jitters. Um, and so what I did was I, I did full practice tests. And then once I was able to identify the specific sections that were causing me trouble, I would time, I would do individual sections timed. Everything was always timed. The LSAT's the type of test that if I, if, you know, if you give somebody an unlimited amount of time, they can probably score on 180, a lot of people, but that's, that's not the point of it. The point of it is you're doing you're doing the test under a timed scenario. Um, and so like, for example, Logic came kind of like gave me a tough, a tough go at it at the beginning. And so when I was able to identify that, I would drill Logic games over and over again. Um, I, I believe if the setup hasn't changed, it's four Logic games for like a 35 minute window. And so I, once I, even further than that, once I identified the type of logic games that were giving me a, a lot of trouble, I would drill individual games and try to do it in under eight minutes. So I kind of like started big. I started at big practice tests. And then as I realized what my strengths and my weaknesses were, I narrowed it down, but always under timed constraints. Um, somebody, I, I don't see it in the chat anymore, but somebody asked me or asked um, how many hours I would dedicate. So during the five-week course, it was very much almost like a full day of, um, of work or a full day of, of class. So from like 9 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. Um, that worked for a five-week course. And because I was doing it with other people, I'm not sure that I, I that would have worked on my own. That would lead to a lot of burnout. Um, and some people, their mentality is to just grind through it. I think that actually 
test taking is a very emotional thing sometimes more than we we recognize and so taking care of your relationship towards this test and towards yourself and avoiding burnout is super important so when I came back and studied on my own um the way I would do it is I would usually just do like three or four hours a day however long it took to actually take the practice test score the practice test and then go through the the uh, and the questions that I missed and then that was it that was my day of work I couldn't I felt that doing more than that was leading to diminish, diminishing returns and um, that that just wasn't going to lead to good performance on the test for me. Um, Alice, I think, I think you have a question. We have a question for Alice and then we also, I did want to tack this one on because I would really like for it to be in the recording. I don't think we've gotten this question before and I think it could um, be really, really fruitful. And this, either one of you can take this on, but it might be more for Alice in regards to, um, so it's in regards to, uh, uh, someone asked if the panel could touch on disabilities and special accommodations. And I assume this is in reference to the actual application process. Um, so if there's anything that you would like to share uh, and Maida, if you have anything to share on this, you are also welcome to, but yeah, take it away. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so in our application, in Berkeley Law's application, we actually don't ask about any sort of um, ability status or accommodations. And of course, if you do take the LSAT with accommodations, it's not going to show up anywhere in the CAS report. So I think this is really just a personal, personal decision. Um, if you feel like you would like to disclose this and talk about this particular identity, um, you're welcome to do so in your application. We definitely um, have seen that done well, either in the personal statement or perhaps in a diversity statement. So if you'd like to talk, that, talk about that or about the process of getting accommodations, um, we've had students also talk about um, facing a lot of obstacles, you know, at their school and what they did to advocate to change those or to get the accommodations that they were needed. Um, so it can definitely be done successfully. We also have people that, you know, don't want, you know, don't want to disclose that as part of their application and that's completely fine as well. So I think just making a personal decision of what you're comfortable discussing in your application. Um, and then I'll quickly answer the other question. I don't want to type it out because it, it does require a little bit more um, discussion about sort of what sets a, you know, a law school applicant out or what can make me stand out. It's a common question we get. Um, and it's not really something we can answer very well because that's really going to depend on like you as an applicant. There is no specific thing that we're looking for. Um, it's really going to be those personal pieces. As I said before, like, we're never going to be um, judging you solely on like your GPA or LSAT. That's not going to be like impressive for us. Those are just numbers at the end of the day. So those, per the personal statement, the resume, those, any of the addenda, those are where you can really stand out and set yourself apart. So my biggest piece of advice is just to make sure you're setting aside time to complete those um, and that they really do sort of reflect um, you know, your full and complete self. And that's, that's where we're like, wow, this person is amazing. We can really see, you know, what they want to do. They're going to be a great contribution. We really need to have them at our law school. So there's no experience that's going to cover all of that. Um, but yeah, that's my best piece of advice is to think to yourself what sets you apart and then making sure that's reflected in those personal pieces. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. And I know we're over time, so I do want to be uh, respectful of everyone time and probably end it here. I think we have answered everyone's questions in the Q&A box um, and or allowed. Um, one last reminder is please fill out the feedback form that has been shared in the chat a couple of times. That'll be super important. That is your ticket into the $50 raffle for all of the webinars we're doing this summer. And as a reminder, you can always register for our upcoming webinars and all of our webinars at any point during the year at Central Valley Scholars dot org slash events. Uh, thank you again, Alice and Maida for being here. We really appreciate it. Sorry we didn't get around to um, giving folks a chance to raise their hand to ask questions, but it seems like for the most part, we've been able to get to everyone. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording now.